the foundation hides most of its secrets, not for the protection of humanity, but for cover-up of its own ends. We have uncovered a series of files that offer us a rare opportunity to observe how secrets slowly escape their control. We will analyze this series of communications between the high command of the Foundation until we reach the current documentation of an anomaly resulting from the aberrant practices of the SCP Foundation. Through the ciphered file, on Monday, July 28, 2014, at 12.50 pm, K. Thomas wrote, R. As per all 5.1's instructions, I have sent you a copy of 3002's file. Let me know if you need anything else. Dr. K. Thomas, Information and Memetics Division, Side 82. Document prepared by Dr. Diary Lloyd. Date 2014, July 20th. Item number SCP 3002. Object class Safe. Special containment procedures. A single prisoner affected by SCP 3002 is to be kept for the purposes of testing and analysis. They will be held in a standard humanoid containment cell inside 41. Verbal and physical interaction is to be limited to approved testing. The remaining prisoners and staff members of South Rock Penitentiary have been given Class B amnestics and are to be monitored for any reoccurrence of SCP-3002. Description SCP-3002 refers to a specific memory shared by 85% of the prisoner population of the South Rock Penitentiary, located near Lafayette, Indiana. Affected inmates are all able to recall a specific day from their childhood. Specific dates vary between subjects, but the majority remember this day occurring sometime between the ages of 10 and 13. SCP-302 accounts consist of the individual working through or playing in a forested garden with their best friend at the time. At some point in their memory, it may recall getting into an argument with their friend. Several accounts have details that conflict with the person's actual life, as several subjects did not live in or travel to locations with forests until their adult life. SCP-302 was originally discovered when Dr. Susan Fairbank, a psychologist working at the prison, Notice a large amount of inmates mentioning specific memories that all seem to be identical. The incident was brought to the attention of the Foundation after agents monitoring a message board concerning psychology for a different anomaly. Notice Dr. Fairbank's account of the shared memory. At the time of initial containment, inmates were able to recall details of SCP-302 with ADT clarity. After several interviews, the subjects began to recall progressively less detail in SCP-3002, to the point where recollection of the affected memory was similar to normal memories. The reason behind this is unclear. Addendum 3002-1 John Bailesh was incarcerated in South Rock Penitentiary in 2006 for multiple accounts of breaking and entering, aggravated assault, and vehicular manslaughter. Dr. Lloyd was chosen to conduct this interview. Begin log. Dr. Lloyd enters the interview room and takes a seat. Bailesh was led into the room shortly after and secured to the table. You know, I can't addict these new vlogs, but I thought I wasn't in for a transfer. Well, it's not a normal transfer, and most likely won't be permanent. I'm Dr. Lloyd. I have a few questions to ask you. Well, that's a shame. You folks got good grip. Right. Would you like some water or something else to drink before we begin? Uh, sure. Why not? The water will be here in a moment. Now, John, if John is what you go by, I want you to think back to your childhood. Are there any memories that stand out for you? Fun birthdays? Broken bones? Days in the park? Anything? Subject waves hand dismissively. Call me whatever, but why do you care? You some sort of shrink? Please answer the question, John. Fine, fine, whatever. Subject is silent for several seconds and looks contemplative. Giving it some thought, 
I remember the 17th of January, 1997. Me and John were playing in Brown Woods, a uh, park by where we grew up. It was between me and John, so we... John? Oh yeah, sorry. John was a kid I spent a lot of time with when we were kids. I went by Joey back then. John Denusio was his name, I think. The John Denusio mentioned was confirmed to be an actual person through census records and social media. He is currently living in Lansing, Michigan. Observation has revealed no anomalous effects. An auxiliary staff enters the room, delivers several bottles of water, and exits. Anyways, we are just messing around. Bing, to the squirrels. It had been cloudy for a while, but it was otherwise a great day. Then we just wanted to get out of the house. As we were talking, we got to the topic of school. A new kid has just started the class. I think her family moved from Slovakia or something. But John just started going on and on and on about how much of a... She was... Kinda being racist. That was just... Weird. I'd known John forever and he was always nice to everyone. Did you do anything about his, uh, ranting? Yeah, I called him out on that. I mean, his mom was Polish. God, I don't know what happened, but what he said just got under my skin. After I yelled at him, we just sort of shut up and went our separate ways. Did anything else of note happen? Subject sights, and he's silent for several seconds. Yeah, Lily found me. Was she a friend of yours? Yeah, she was always a little weird. I think she was... Subject gesticulates at his head. You know. Like, when she found me in the park, the first thing she did was get really close, put her hands on my shoulders, and asked me super seriously if I remembered her, and then just went on and on about some school project. Honestly, how could I forget Lily? She was always... Subject is silent for several seconds. Huh. I can't actually remember. Can you at least recall what she looked like? Yeah, she had super blonde hair, I think, and she... Subject looks confused and remains silent for several seconds. I... I can't remember nothing. But that's not right. She was one of my best friends, was she? I swear I know her, but I... Subject puts his face in his hands. Please, try to be calm. We'll have you transferred back to your cell shortly. In law. After several interviews, multiple common details could be found between all accounts of SCP-3002. This includes the weather being cloudy but warm, an argument with the friend concerning the new child in school and the presence of a female child with blonde hair, most often described as Slovakian or Eastern European. Second deciphered file. On Tuesday, December 15, 2015, at 8.03 p.m., 051, wrote, R. I'm not sure if this means she's back, or if these are just jumbles of her memories. Thoughts? Is there a possibility Project Lethe had additional side effects we didn't account for? I want to make sure that this won't come back to hurt us. Keep an eye on this. Abelis, O5 Command Document prepared by Dr. Darren Lloyd Date, 2015, December 13th Warning, the following document contains a Class 2 info hazard, mild danger. Memetic safety procedures enacted, using seed. Item number SCP-3002 Object class, Euclid Special containment procedures A single written account of SCP-3002 has been stored inside 41's anomalous document vault. Testing must be performed by at least three staff members with O3-3002 security clearance. The test subject and any personnel who does not have an active CL-2 memetic countermeasure must be given Class C amnestics following the test. All documents concerning SCP-302 
must have mimetic countermeasures able to suppress a class 2 infohazard. In addition, documentation is not allowed to leave the SCP-302 research space or to be shown to personnel not on the SCP-302 project. A single person from the initial group discovered to have been affected by SCP-302 is to be kept in a standard humanoid containment cell for the purpose of long-term study and analysis of SCP-302 exposure. If any person is discovered to have been affected by SCP-302, they are to be given Class C or Class B amnestics, depending on when it was determined they were initially contaminated. Currently, a means to memetically or physically identify a person affected by SCP-302 without the need for vocal confirmation is being researched. Tentatively titled Project Beselka. Speak to Dr. Lloyd for more information on this project. Non-emergency update. 2016. Project Beselka has begun final testing, with early trials showing great success in identifying affected individuals without the need for an interview. Instructions and equipment to properly use the project are being shipped to Foundation sites and operatives in Indiana and parts of Illinois. Assigned agents should begin searching high population areas such as Indianapolis and Chicago first, before moving towards low population areas. Description: SCP-302 is a class 2 contagious memetic hazard with a limited effect on the memories of subjects exposed to it. The anomaly implants a memory with the subject's mind, which subjects identify as their own. SCP-302 is transmitted through any communication describing the anomalous memory, including text and speech. An SCP-302 memory is typically set in the subject's youth. All accounts have the subject spending time in a local park with a person they consider their best friend. Several details are consistent between all memories, including the fact that the date in question was cloudy, but fairly warm, that the subject and their friend got into an argument about a new child at school, and that the new child was a Slovakian immigrant by the name of Lili Veselga, labeled the CP302-1. Occasionally, subjects will recall Lili sitting on a bench near them or asking them specific questions, although their details differ between subjects. SCP-302-1 is most often described as having pale blonde hair and appearing anemic. Subjects recall her asking them very specific questions, generally about herself or a project that is assumed to be related to school. SCP-302 was originally discovered when a psychologist working at South Rock Penitentiary in northwestern Indiana noticed a large amount of inmates mentioning identical memories. Once the foundation was involved, over 85% of the prison population appeared to have been affected by SCP-302. The anomaly was documented and labeled as low-priority research. When initially documented, affected inmates displayed a perfect recollection. However, as the interviews and testing progressed through the affected prisoners, recollection of the anomalous memory began to show progressively fewer details. Incident 302-2 on 2016, three staff members attempted to access SCP-302's documentation, despite either not having proper clearance or not having reasonable prior knowledge of SCP-302. The access log from that date has been included below. Time, user, position, terminal, omitted, action, 3.15 pm. J. Bowes 1. Janitor. Improper clearance. Access denied. 3.20 p.m. Arcade 12. Active agent. Improper clearance. Access denied. 3.40 p.m. Bander D8. Senior researcher. Access granted. Minor edits made. 6.25 p.m. Rise out with. Edits reverted. 6.35 p.m. Bander D8. Senior researcher. Access granted. Minor edits made. 6.40 p.m. Rise out with. Edits reverted. File locked. Rise officials conducted interviews with 
and amnestized all three individuals. The interview with researcher Vanderbilt has been logged below. Begin log. Rice officer Whitley enters the interrogation room. Dr. Vanderbilt has been previously placed in the room by Rice as security operatives. Dr. Damian Vanderbilt, I am Officer Whitley, with the Records and Information Security Administration. I am speaking with you today due to concern over your recent edits to documentation of a certain anomaly. Subject appears confused. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, son. Dr. Vanderbilt, if you could please refer to me as Whitley or Officer Whitley. The documentation in question is for SCP-3002. Yesterday evening, edits were made to the documents using your account and personal terminal. I apologize, officer, but I'm not sure which anomaly that is. I'm staffed with several projects right now, and I was working on several files and reports, all of which are within my purview to edit. Rice officer Willy opens their briefcase and produces a folder containing a physical copy of SCP-302's documentation. Oh, right, that anomaly. I remember seeing a few minor errors, so I went and fixed them when I had some time for myself. According to our records, this was the first time you have accessed SCP-3002's documentation. Are you sure? Because I swear I've seen this before. Subject is silent for several seconds. Oh, wait, I do remember. I saw it over Lloyd's shoulder while I was walking to get lunch. That is impossible. Due to the nature of SCP-3002, all information and documentation can only be accessed in a controlled environment. This is enforced through a specially created memetic lock, which you bypass using administrative privileges. Okay, but that doesn't change the fact that all I did was a few minor grammatical edits. That also appears to be false. While grammatical edits were made, you also edited several instances of the phrase SCP-3002, and variations thereof to Lili Beselka. You also removed the line specifying that the being in associated memories was Slovakian. But she's not Slovakian. I've known her since I was a kid. And granted, she doesn't have an accent, she is not Slovakian. Our reports are supposed to be factual, so I was making sure it was. And now that I think about it, I don't remember where she's from. Thank you for your cooperation, Dr. Vanderbilt. And lo. Dr. Vanderbilt was subsequently identified to have been affected by SCP-3002. He was given Class B amnestics and relocated to Site-726. Dr. Lloyd was investigated for improper handling of SCP documentation. However, it was determined that Lloyd had never brought SCP-3002's files outside of its specified research area, which Vanderbilt had no access to. It is currently unknown how SCP-3002 was able to affect him, as no vector of transmission could be determined. Third deciphered file On Monday, August 8, 2016, at 8.49am, 052, wrote R. It appears this is not a side effect, as Bell is tough. She seems to be specifically targeting people who know about Lethe. I sent RRH to take care of any personnel we had on the project and anything left at Site E, but they didn't have time to do much stir before they had to leave to avoid being intercepted. E Perun, O5 Command Document prepared by Dr. Darrell Lloyd Date, 2016, August 4th Warning, the following document contains a Class X info hazard, extreme danger. Memetic safety procedures enacted. For personnel with proper clearance, multiple high-intensity memetic countermeasures have been spread randomly throughout the document. Attempting to access this document with improper clearance will result in anti-memetic suppression. See it. Item number SCP-3002. Object class. Gather. Special containment procedures. All texts containing SCP-3002 must be destroyed aside from the official SCP documentation. Access to SCP-3002 documentation 
is limited to personnel with level 4 slash 30 true security clearance or higher. Administrator override has been revoked, with the exception of O5 command and the current director of the Records and Information Security Administration. Procedure Veselka has been updated to include a memetic trigger, which can be used to identify affected persons. If an affected person is detected, they are to be sedated using ranged weaponry and collected or terminated. Depending on their prominence or importance, an affected individual may be surgically amnesticized. If all memories have been contaminated, or a sufficiently large proportion so as to impede normal functioning following surgery, the affected subject may be terminated with standard foundation protocols being an act for concealing their dead. All foundation personnel above level 3 clearance are to be considered important individuals if they are discovered to have been affected. Surgical removal of memories has shown to be the only reliable way to remove SCP-002 from a person. Pharmaceutical and aerial amnestics have failed to remove the anomaly in all cases since. 2016 Any print companies or websites that are actively creating content containing SCP-002, whether knownly or not, are to be shut down and their owners terminated. All content they have created is to be destroyed. No testing or interviews may be held concerning SCP-002 without the express permission of the current project head, which is currently Dr. Lloyd. Description SCP-002 is a Class X contagious memetic hazard with wide-ranging effects on the memories of subjects exposed to it. The anomaly can remove alter or replace any memory of the subject, and can create new memories in the subject which are not based on the subject's actual experience. SCP-002 is capable of affecting declarative memories, memories involving personal experiences or factual information, and implicit memories, memories acquired and used unconsciously, typically referred to as muscle memory. Affected subjects identify alter memories as their own, and will behave accordingly. In this way, SCP-002 has the ability to influence the personalities and actions of subjects. The transmission vector for SCP-002 was originally believed to be the communication of a particular false memory, involving a childhood walk in the woods, an argument with a friend, and an immigrant girl named Lily Veselka. It has since been determined that the communication of any memory by an affected subject can lead to SCP-002 infection. Communication can be by way of text, speech, electronic correspondence, mathematical formulas, and TOF, in the case of telepathic entities or equipment. While transmission may not include reference to the Lily Veselka false memory, persons affected by SCP-002 will generally recall a humanoid female by the name, forming part of unrelated memories or experiences. This entity, referred to as SCP-002-1, it's described as having extremely pale blonde hair, appearing anemic, and being a childhood friend, originally from an Eastern European country. In affected memories, SCP-002-1 is often remembered approaching subjects and asking them questions pertaining to herself or an unspecified object, such as, what do you know about me, or has the project finished? SCP-002 has avoided containment by displaying extremely adaptive behavior. Due to its adaptive behavior, it has been theorized that SCP-002 or SCP-002-1 may be sapient. Epidemiological studies appear to indicate it is deliberately targeting individuals who create large amounts of information, or people who do large amounts of research on Slavic or Eastern European history and geography. SCP-002 was originally discovered in 2014, when a prison psychologist reported that a large number of inmates appeared to have extremely similar memories regarding a specific day from their childhoods. When initially contained, it was believed that the anomaly was a simple shared memory. However, for the research revealed the CP-302's unknown effects at the time, it is believed that much of the prison staff was contaminated by the anomaly and are currently unknowingly acting as vectors to spread it. While specific data is still being gathered, it is suspected much of the population of the Midwest USA 
has been exposed to SCP-3002. Addendum 3002-4 Approximately four months after conducting interview 3002-3, Rice officer Whitley lost control of their vehicle during a vacation that they had scheduled following the previous interview. While not fatal, Officer Whitley did suffer several spinal injuries. A RISA official who initially spoke to Whitley regarding the incident noted their unusual behavior and correlated it back to the known effects of SCP-302. Following this, Dr. Lloyd was contacted to conduct an interview with Whitley. Begin, Log. Dr. Lloyd enters RISA Officer Whitley's room in Medical Site 923 and activates a physical mimetic countermeasure, designed as part of Project Peselka. Dr. Lloyd, it is a pleasure to see you. Likewise, Whit. Are they treating you well? Comfortable? Food decent? Yes, yes, and I'd rather not say. Lloyd claps his hands together. So, Jen told me you've been a bit under the weather. In regards to your... Lloyd makes a motion pointing to his head. To my knowledge, no. Right, um, so you remember a few weeks ago you talked to Vanderbilt about Lily, er, uh, SCP-302? Oh, yes. I apologize. My injury has caused my memory to be less reliable lately. Do you remember some time in your past or childhood meeting a girl by the name of Lily Beselka? Think closely. She doesn't like to be thought about when she doesn't want to be. I cannot recall anyone by that name. <sighs> Alright. Let's shift focus. Your recent actions have been strange. Unnatural. What have you done recently? When did you go on vacation? For some time, I had felt a mild compulsion to do research on a particular topic. Specifically, within Foundation files and knowledge bases. Did you act on that dirge at will, Wit? I need to know. Negative, Doctor. I recognized the possible presence of a harmful meme and took the proper countermeasures to remove it. Frowns. Is that all? No. Once I had the threat properly removed, I performed this research on my own volition, to satisfy my own curiosity. I found several mentions of an entity similar to SCP-302 and a certain project working under the title Lethe. Yes, but what did you find, Wit? I don't have all day. What did you learn about Lily? I would rather not say. My vehicular collision was not an accident, despite security footage showing otherwise. I was pressured off the road by the sudden acts of three otherwise unrelated vehicles working in tandem. Whitley, this is your last chance to answer. I believe you are contaminated by SCP-302 and are deliberately withholding information to interfere with research. Dr. Lloyd, I do not adequately feel I can trust you. I apologize, but I do not feel I would like to continue this interview. Whitley was unresponsive to all other questions. And log. It was determined Rice Officer Whitley had been affected by SCP-302 since their interaction with Dr. Vanderbilt. Due to the disruption and danger Whitley posed to the Foundation and SCP-302, they were recommended for termination. Termination was carried out on 2016 by the use of lethal injection. Exploration Log 3002-5 Following information extracted from Agents were dispatched to the Ushansky National Park on the west edge of Ukraine. Agents discovered a ruined subterranean research facility that appeared to have been abandoned since 2013. Markings and documents found in the facility indicate it was associated with the Foundation. No record of a facility in this location exists in Ukrainian or Foundation records. Despite the general condition of the facility indicating a long period of abandonment, there was some evidence of recent activity. Large amounts of documents and papers were found burned and several computers were found to be missing memory and storage devices. One of the facility's furnaces was discovered to have been activated shortly before the agents' arrivals. The ashes inside were later analyzed and determined to contain traces of human DNA matching SCP. While searching through the facility, agents discovered an office area with several piles of burned documents. 
one document was found in a readable seat following chemical treatment. Belis, I do not believe continuing active work on Project Lete is a productive use of our resources. While Lete has been an invaluable tool for averting broken masquerade type scenarios, having the project rely on a single anomaly has been caused undue stress in the subject. She has been displaying decreasingly less motor and cognitive function, which may be a consequence of the invasive equipment being used for the procedure. As an example of her cognitive deterioration, she does not respond or register her previous name or designation. In addition to that, he has been becoming increasingly less willing to work with the technicians, to the point of resorting to self-harm in attempts to avoid the procedures. At the current moment, she is under constant observation due to the fact that she attempted suicide several days ago. We are not entirely sure how, but it is currently believed she hid a dining utensil during a meal, and sharpened it over the next few weeks. We have previously attempted to avoid this type of emotional distress by letting her participate in the various hobbies and activities she enjoyed prior to containment, such as photography and reading. With all that said, I do believe a control over mass amnestic or mass memory altering anomaly is practical in the event of a broken masquerade scenario, so continuing research and development in this field would be wise. As we know for a fact that the memetic trigger used in Lete is present in all but a negligible amount of the population, perhaps we could alter it to give us further control over their memories, instead of acting as an anchoring point for our subject. Since we've included the trigger with the neural archetype scans from Yellowstone, a procedure that is not reliant on a human subject would allow for continued use past the lifespan of our current subject. Perun. While investigating the facility, agents discovered a surgical theater fitted with equipment used for invasive neurosurgery. Medical documents and restraints found in the room indicate the subject or subjects operated in this location were conscious during the length of the procedures. Wear of the equipment indicates frequent use. Current iteration of SCP file Item number SCP-3 is here too. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. See document 302-6. All contaminated people must be destroyed, including former staff, family and acquaintances. The staff must be vetted by either 051 or 052 before access to this document or any remaining staff is allowed. Description SCP-302 is a sapient mimetic entity capable of and currently attempting to create an MK-class end-of-the-world scenario, total loss of human consciousness. SCP-302 does not have a definite form, instead, it resides in the information or memory to which it has access. While within a person's mind, SCP-302 is capable of mimicking, altering, and removing their memories, there does not seem to be a limit to the changes the entity is capable of performing. When SCP-302 mimics a memory or a piece of information, the original information becomes an additional instance of the anomaly. In doing this, the anomaly is capable of being present in all information and memories of a person. Once all facets of a person's mind have been contaminated, the person effectively loses conscious control of their bodies. Generally, SCP-302 allows her victims to live and act normally. However, when she encounters an unexposed person, she will influence all people in the area to converge on the person and forcefully expose them. While being controlled by SCP-302, victims show no self-preservation instincts. SCP-302 is extremely hostile, and is actively attempting to find and kill or contaminate all remaining Foundation personnel. She seems to be searching for any personnel involved with Project Lete and Site E, an undocumented Foundation resource facility located in Osansky National Park. SCP-302 is capable of spreading between people through the exchange of information. As she is able to mimic any information, all information is considered a vector of SCP-302. It is currently believed that 78% of human population is contaminated by the entity, and that 84% of new information and content created since 2014 contains SCP-302. SCP-302 has displayed an extreme level of adaptability, 
preventing it from ever having been fully contained. In addition to this, several key Foundation employees were effectively being controlled by SCP-302 since its initial discovery. With access to internal Foundation procedures and plans, she was able to avoid being properly detected or analyzed for some time. Document 302-6 Due to the widespread contamination of SCP-302, containment is impossible. Remaining staff members may submit proposal for determination of the anomaly. Proposal Contact known groups and persons of interest for additional aid. Dr. Kent Mayfield Command response Approved 9 to 4 Follow up Global Local Coalition No response Unusual Incidents Units Response 051 confirmed the presence of SCP-302 Response destroyed Mana Charitable Foundation No response The Horizon Initiative no response. GRU Division P. No response. Office for the Reclamation of Islamic Artifacts. No response. Prometheus Labs Incorporated. No response. The Chaos Insurgency. Response. An unintelligible block of recording. Anderson's Robotics. No response. Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Response. O51 confirmed the presence of SCP-302. Response destroyed. Are we cool yet? Response. A box filled with several hard drives and digital storage devices containing copies of and plans for several anomalous art pieces. The Serpent's Hand. Response. A message reading, We are unable to offer support this time. We fear she is among us now. WL. Nobody. Response. A small note reading, you should have expected this. Proposal. Destroy all information and contaminated people. Repopulate the Earth using SCP-2000. Dr. Connor Teach. Command response. Declined. 2 to 8. Follow-up. No follow-up. Due to the massive distance between our current location and the location of SCP-2000, and the fact that no communication has been established with the site. Our current consensus is that the CP-2000 and its staff have been contaminated. We do not feel the risk is worth the attempt. A. Vélez, 051 Proposal Create an anti-meme capable of suppressing SCP-302 for a temporary amount of time. Dr. Kent Mayfield Command response Approved 5 to 4 Follow-up an anti-meme capable of suppressing all memetic threats was created, based on the memetic countermeasures used by Risa. During testing, it was discovered that the anti-meme had no effect on SCP-302. It is believed that the anomaly altered the anti-meme in a similar method to how it normally affects memories. As SCP-302 seemed to be able to emulate an anti-meme, we began investigating into the possibility that it was capable of hiding itself as an anti-meme within a person's mind, effectively making them an unconscious agent for it. Following this lead, we discovered more than six people were contaminated in this fashion, including multiple members of the O5 command. C. Green, O58. Proposal: Initiate the Ganymede protocol. We need to start over. Dr. Connor Teach. Command response: Declined. 2 to 6. Follow-up. No follow-up. There is no reason to enact such a drastic action. C. Green. 05A. Proposal. Investigate further into Project Lethe in an attempt to find a possible way to stop her. Dr. Connor Teach. Command response. Declined. 1 to 3. Follow-up. No follow-up. There is no reason to investigate further into that project. Nothing additional will be gained from it. In addition, the O5 command has reasonable cause to believe you have been contaminated. Termination will occur shortly. A. Vélez, O5-1 Proposal, restart. Command response, no consensus, one to one. Follow-up, field left blank. And low. Did you know that some parts of the cell evolved from viral infections that were absorbed by our DNA? The experts who have analyzed documents 302 
have pointed out that the mimetic infection of the anomaly may develop into this kind of symbiosis sometime in the future. The GOC decided not to respond to the Foundation when they contact us to solve their problem, because everything points out that this anomaly seeks nothing more than revenge for the abuse it suffered at their hands. If the Foundation considered it a dangerous threat, then why did they risk using it to keep their dirty secrets? If they had eliminated it instead of using it for their purposes, they wouldn't be in this situation to begin with. Once again, the Foundation has to spend resources and design complex plans to contain problems that they themselves created. Help us continue to expose the Foundation and its terrible practices by leaving comments and suggestions for future entries below. I am Virus Anonimo, we are the GOC, and you have been informed. <laughs>